Good afternoon. Welcome to Paraspar Lecture, organized by the Office of Communication, Indian Institute of Science. Today we are very happy to have Professor Estevan Parzel, who will speak on the topic, A Clash of Imaginary Civilization. Before we begin, let me give you a brief introduction of the speaker today. Uh, Estevan Parzel is professor at the, in the Department of Medieval Studies at the Central European University, Vienna. He has extensively worked on late antique and patristic philosophy. One of his research project, project is on Christian Platonism and Byzantine theology. Uh, he has also worked on Syriac Christianity, including the Syriac Christians of India. In the year 2000, he initiated the digitization and cataloging of the manuscript collections of St. Thomas Christian of Kerala. Uh, the project has resulted in the collection of digital images of 1,500 paper manuscripts written in Syriac and Gars uh, Garsuni Malayalam and 60,000 palm leaf manuscripts as well as the documentation of architectural monuments, art artworks and inscriptions. The material is archived in Hill Museum and Man Manuscript Library. Puzzles, uh, puzzles uh, publications on Indian subject include the uh, Nomo Canon of Metropolitan Abdicio of uh, Nisibis. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. <laughs> A uh, Fasquemile uh, edition of MS64 from the collection of the Church of the East in Prisu, published in 2009. A co-edited volume uh, uh, titled Christianity in Asia, Sacred Art and Visual Splendor, published in 2016. A series of studies of, on in Indian Christianity and the Indian manuscript collection, including classical Syriac as a modern lingua franca in South India between 1600 and 2006, published in 2009. Garsuni Malayalam, a witness to an early stage of Indian Christian literature, published in 2014, Accommodationist Strategies on the Malabar Coast, Competition of Complementary Tree, published in 2018, Syriac Christians in India, 2019, and Notes on Syrian Learning in South India in the Middle Ages and Early Modernity is forthcoming. The material digitized in India is being published online by Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, and the catalogs are forthcoming. With Anshuman Pandey and the program team of George Kiraz, he participated in the collaboration of Unicode fonts on the Garsuni Malayalam script, which facilitated the printing of Garsuni Malayalam text for the first time in history. Professor Purcell, I welcome you to give your lecture. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for this invitation and thank you so much for coming. Um, Basically, um, uh, yes, basically I'm, I'm very much honored to uh, be given the honor of giving a Paraspar lecture. Um, before I start my presentation, however, I would like to tell that this is an inaugural lecture in a series which my friend Udai Balakrishnan, whom perhaps all of you know, and I have invented, and we are very much inspired by the ideas of Professor Raghavendra Gadakkar, according to whom uh, one becomes a good scientist if one is also aware of, has a certain awareness of the humanities and the social sciences. And what we want to initiate now is an interface between the social sciences and the humanities and, uh, the, the, and science and technology, most of all because the institutions like the Indian Institute of Science are educating the future decision makers of India. And such institutions worldwide are educating future decision makers. And we think that, um, that a good understanding of history helps making sound decisions. The, this first lecture is, will be followed by a discussion on Monday, to which I invite all of you at the Bangalore International Center on the possible historical roots of the war in Ukraine. There will be because we will, we will discuss, we could bring together Russian and Ukrainian participants, so we will stop in 1917 to avoid the most difficult questions. The most difficult questions will be 
uh, dealt with by uh, um, now British scholar of Indian origin, uh, Dr. Samir Puri, that will be the next lecture. Then there will be a lecture on the European Union. There will be a lecture on the historical roots of the ecological crisis. Um, um, because we really think that now uh, uh, humanities and social science scholars should come to the fore and speak up uh, in order to participate in a certain sense in the decision making because many times very wrong decisions are being taken. And what I will speak about today is um, pseudo-scientific theory, I call it pseudo-scientific, about the existence of world civilizations. And this theory leading to an idea of a certain clash of civilizations. Uh, because uh, there is this idea that there are these civilizations, these civilizations have developed independently of each other, and this development now that there is the decline of the so-called Western civilization will inevitably uh, lead and inevitably leads uh, to a clash of these civilizations. Now, what if these, uh, these civilizations have never existed? Then what we are seeing now is a clash of imaginary civilizations. And it's our imagination which has created this. So I would, I would like to uh, say some words about the history of this idea and also about alternative ideas because I think that decision makers are still stuck with uh, historical ideas in which real historians don't believe anymore. The, the beginning is an emblematic picture of Spiridon Romans uh, in the British Library, uh, the East offering its riches uh, to Britain. And Britannia is represented uh, by this uh, white lady, and India is represented by the black lady offering all the jewels uh, to Britannia. Uh, you see a Chinese lady uh, turning the back, you see an Indian representing America, and under the arm of Mer Mercury, who represents trade, uh, there is also a representation of Persia. And in the very background, you see a ship, which is that of the East India Company. The, uh, the figure here is the Thames, and uh, the lion, of course, represents the might of Britain. I am starting with a political issue. I am from Hungary, and uh, uh, this is a statement by the Prime Minister of Hungary, who thinks he is in the forefront of the defense of European Christian civilization. This is from a publication of his, uh, given in 2017, but one could uh, quote his uh, further uh, sayings because he has not changed his mind ever since. The biggest debate in Europe today is about migration. This is what our future stands or falls on, the fate of Europe. The question is whether the character of European nations will be determined by the same spirit, civilization, culture and mentality as in our parents' and grandparents' time, or by something completely different. Those calling themselves liberal and left-wing, who are supported with the money, power, and networks of international forces, with George Soros at the forefront, claim that taking action against migration is wrong, impractical, and immoral. In contrast with this, we want to preserve the foundations of Europe. We do not want parallel societies, we do not want population exchanges, and we do not want to replace Christian civilization with a different kind. Therefore, we are building fences, defending ourselves, and not allowing migrants to, uh, to, to flood us. Um, I think this is an emblematic expression of 
the idea of defending at any price the European civilization. And here I think it's very important to ask whether such a civilization exists. You may remember Gandhi saying when he was asked, uh, what do you think about Western civilization? He said, it would be a good idea. Um, of course, Gandhi also b believed in the civilization theory, and he thought that Indian civilization was superior to the Western. What I am claiming here, but let us not run, uh, I will just continue. There is another voice in the West, and I am quoting from a recent book of his, Pope Francis, um, who seems to reply, I don't say to Prime Minister Orban, but to the views represented also by Prime Minister Orban. A fantasy of national populism in countries with Christian majorities is its defense of Christian civilization from perceived enemies, whether Islam, Jews, the European Union, or the United Nations. The defense appeals to those who are often no longer religious, but who regard their nation's inheritance as a kind of identity. The loss of relationship with God and the loss of a sense of universal fraternity have contributed to this sense of isolation and fear of the future. Thus, irreligious or superficially religious people uh, <clears throat> vote for populists to protect their religious identity, unconcerned that fear and hatred of the other cannot be reconciled with the gospel. The heart of Christianity is God's love for all peoples and our love for our neighbors, especially those in need. To reject a struggling migrant, whatever his or her religious belief, out of fear of diluting a Christian culture is grotesquely to misinterpret both Christianity and culture. Migration is not a threat to Christianity except in the minds of those who benefit from claiming it is. To promote the gospel and not welcome the strangers in need, nor affirm their humanity as children of God, is to seek to encourage a culture that is Christian in name only, emptied of all that makes it distinctive. Here, Pope Francis makes a distinction between faith or religion and culture. He thinks that the coming of foreigners is not a, a, <clears throat> not a, a threat to the Christian culture, but he thinks that whoever is behaving in a cruel manner with his neighbor is betraying Christianity. That, how to say, there is a kind of historical and scholarly background to this, because Pope Francis is a Jesuit. And the Jesuits were those in Christianity who have always separated faith from culture. This is why they tried to implant Christian faith in foreign countries, be it in the Americas or in Asia or India, uh, adopting the local culture, like Roberto de Nobili, who was uh, dressing as a Brahmin and who wrote uh, works uh, which were very much in the style of uh, Tamil uh, Shaiva literature. Now the question is, and here comes the historical survey, how have we arrived here? And uh, I would simply present the, uh, the, the, the shield, the, uh, uh, the emblem of the, the East India Company. The East India Company and the conquest of half of the world by the British was very instrumental in the creation of the civilizationist argument, although I think that the most powerful exponent of this argument was uh, Hegel, the German philosopher. But let us go forward. Before entering the history, I would like to quote someone whom I respect very much, um, the alternative economist, Ernst Schumacher, whose book, Small is Beautiful, 
I had the privilege to translate into Hungarian a long, long time ago. And this is from the sixth chapter, The Greatest Resource, Education. The ideas of the fathers in the 19th century have been visited on the third and fourth generations living in the second half of the 20th century. To their originators, these ideas were simply the result of their intellectual processes. In the third and fourth generations, they have become the very tools and instruments through which the world is being experienced and interpreted. Those that bring forth new ideas are seldom ruled by them, but their ideas obtain power over men's lives in the third and fourth generations. When they have become a part of that great mass of ideas, including language, which seeps into a person's mind during his dark ages, that is to say, the time uh, until the end of puberty. These 19th century ideas are firmly lodged in the minds of practically everybody in the Western world today, whether educated or uneducated. In the uneducated mind, they are still rather muddled and nebulous, too weak to make the world intelligible. And this is a very difficult issue. We are heirs to 19th century ideas. We believe they are truth, while they are images of fantasy, which had a certain uh, rationality in the minds of their inventors. But they lived in their time, and they were also limited by the limits of their times. But we can go even farther to start our historical survey. And this is something which is very important for me, and about which I have never really read. Uh, two models of governance, uh, which were there in the ancient world, um, at least from Europe up to India, I would say. And this is the Hellenistic model versus the Roman model. What is the Roman model? All of us know. Uh, we are also celebrating the great achievement of Roman law, uh, equality before the law. Equality before the law means that Roman citizens as individuals were responsible to the state. They had to follow the laws of the state. There was no intermediary between the state authority and the individual. This also meant that the state had an ideology. That was the, uh, the, the cult of the emperor until the coming of Christianity, and later it became Orthodox Christianity in 381, when Theodosius the Great made uh, Christianity the state religion. And in this way, Christianity has replaced uh, the Roman religion, which was based on the cult of the emperor. Earlier, the Christians were persecuted because they refused uh, to uh, sacrifice libations to the emperor. And later, the heretics were persecuted if they refused to uh, confess the orthodox doctrine. But the structure remained the same. What is the Hellenistic model? And here I just uh, uh, gave a mosaic of Alexander the Great, Great, who created the big empire that which then fell into parts, which had a deep impact as far as India. According to the Hellenistic model, uh, the state, the, the empire, or the ruler gives only a limited number of laws. And every community is governed by its own customary laws. The best uh, theory, according to me, to explain uh, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible is that the Ptolemaic rulers wanted to know all the customary laws of their subjects. And so uh, Ptolemaeus Philadelphus, in the fourth century before Christ, ordered the translation of the Hebrew law into Greek, which was the state language. 
Well, how do we know this? Uh, from the same time, we have Greek translations of customary Egyptian law as well. It seems to have been a state enterprise, and the mythic narrative about it basically makes this understand. And the West is, so finally, the Hellenistic rulers were defeated by the Romans, and the Roman model prevailed. And the Roman model also means one only truth, no multiple truths. The truth is that of the state. The truth is not that of diverse communities who may differ in their conception of the truth. And this, I think, prevails even now when, for example, in France, the burqa, the Muslim wear, is forbidden in the name of the uh, laicity, the worldly state, this is the imposition of one only truth on all the communities. The Hellenistic model is different, and although I think this was not in the discussions when the Indian constitution was made, India even uh, uh, even somehow instinctively adopted the Hellenistic model. And this is why in India, every community, uh, how to say, every community has the, the, the right to govern themselves according to their own laws. And this makes a difference. Okay, we have already spoken about the British uh, East India Company. Now, what about the civilization of theory? Until the 19th century, basically until the second half of the 19th century, we were not speaking about civilizations. Um, civilization was a singular term and meant the progress of humanity toward a single goal. Um, it was a teleological idea. It also uh, presupposed a kind of evolution toward the better. Um, now, Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel, uh, in his lectures on the philosophy of world history, has outlined already the civilizational theory without speaking about multiple civilizations. Um, he links the constitution of civilization to a degree of organized statehood and also, very importantly, the sense of history. Civilization is the working of the world spirit for Hegel, which somehow realizes itself in human history. Um, and the main representative of civilization is naturally the West. Here is a quote from Hegel, but more important quotes are coming. Um, now, what is Hegel saying about India? Uh, this is, for Hegel, the par excellence example of an uncivilized nation. <clears throat> uh, can you hear me? Uh, is it okay? Good. In the feudalism of medieval times, individuals were also confined to a certain station in life. But for all, there was a higher being, superior to the most exalted earthly dignity. And the admission to holy orders was open to all, you know, to monasticism and priesthood. This is the grand distinction, that here religion holds the same position towards all. You remember the idea of the Roman law. Towards all, that although free choice is often limited by many restrictive circumstances, the religious element stands in the same relation to all, and all are invested with an absolute value by religion. In India, the direct contrary is the case. But by the fact that in India, as already observed, differences extend not only to the objectivity of spirit, but also to its absolute subjectivity, and thus exhaust all its relations, neither morality, nor justice, nor religiosity is to be found. I hope you don't like this. 
And another thing that, uh, that uh, characterizes India is a lack of the sense of history. India has not only ancient books relating to religion and splendid poetical productions, but also ancient codes the existence of each latter kind of literature has been mentioned as a condition necessary to the origination of history. And yet, history itself cannot be found. The Indian view of things is a universal pantheism, a pantheism, however, of imagination, not of thought. Basically, this follows in a an interesting secularized manner, uh, the discourse of the Christian missionaries. Although Hegel uh, had a strange kind of religion, he was not a, uh, how to say, very religious person, he believed most of all in his own philosophy. The spread of Indian culture is prehistorical, for history is limited to that which makes an essential epoch in the development of spirit. On the whole, the diffusion of Indian culture is only a dumb, deedless expansion. That is, it presents no political action. The people of India have achieved no foreign conquest, but have been on every occasion vanquished themselves. So, apparently, your theoretical superiority with a sense of history gives you somehow the means to conquer other people. Um, <laughs> I just want to, uh, want to show where the origins of the defense of Western civilization against the rising uh, competitive civilizations uh, is coming from. And uh, you may agree perhaps uh, with Pope Francis that it's not coming from the Gospels. It's coming from this colonial experience even though Hungary has never achieved colonizing uh, any country in Asia or Africa, but the, dead, the ideology is still there. And then China. China and India lie, as it were, still outside the world's history, as the mere presupposition of elements whose combination must be waited for to constitute their vital progress. The distinguishing feature of the Chinese people is that everything which belongs to spirit, unconstrained morality, in practice and theory, heart, inward religion, science and art properly so-called, is alien to it. Uh, remember the East offering its riches to Britain. Um, because they are so inferior, the best thing they can do is to offer their riches. <laughs> okay. And I think all of you know the white man's burden. Uh, you will forgive me if, because of lack of time, I will not read it. Moreover, it's a shame. But this is not an oddity. The civilizational theory comes after that in the 19th century and survives on, until now. And here are the great uh, thinkers, those about whom Schumacher spoke when he said that there are the 19th century great minds whose ripples of thought are, uh, are surviving in the underconscious of the present day Western uh, people. But I would say not only of the Western people, also of the other people, because that civilizational theory has been transmitted. Because naturally, then those who were thought to be uncivilized nations, when their national consciousness was uh, arising, they began to speak about their own civilization. And this is how the Muslim Brotherhood uh, began to speak about the superiority of Muslim civilization. Uh, basically, the great Gandhi believed in the superiority of Indian civilization. Um, but again, I am running forward. 
The most important works to be quoted here are Max Weber's Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West, Arnold Toynbee's A Study of History, where he describes the whole history of the world as a history of civilizations, and Carl Jaspers, The Origin and Goal of History. I can't enter every part of this, and my time is Oh, your time is precious, so I should not abuse of it. Um, it is <clears throat> worth, however, stopping for a little while with Weber, who was a great thinker. Um, in, in the economic ethic of world religions, um, published posthumously, he gave the most complete ex ex position of his civilizational theory, but he gave it already in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. His theory was that religion defines ethic and ethic, which defines economic and political behavior. You may remember that he comes after Marx, so it's also a reaction to the Marxist idea that the the economic conditions define the cultural overstructure. Um, and this complex of spiritual and material habitudes defines a civilization which is a strong identitarian entity. Thus there are separate Chinese, Indian, Muslim, Orthodox and Western civilizations and this Western form of Christianity had given rise to the particular Western development, the birth of capitalism, technological and political superiority, and the conquest of the world. At the root of capitalist thought is disenchantment and Zeuberung, introduced to Christianity by Protestantism, the loss of the feeling and the belief in the miraculous. And what is interesting is that this is not a positive uh, development for Weber. Weber was a very dubitative mind. He thought it was so, but he was very, very dubitative about the value of this uh, process. Post-Weberians, however, took this model and took it to be the grand justification of their civilizationist theories. And here I come to the end, I'm literally jumping. Um, uh, this has led uh, to a very shallow journalistic uh, reformulation of the Weberian civilizational theory by Samuel Huntington in The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of the World Order, which has been many times refuted ever since by specialists because it's based on non-existent historical facts but still has an incredible impact on decision makers in the world. Uh, be why? Because of the extreme simplicity of the theory which is appealing. You read it, you understand it immediately, you are exempted from thinking too much and you can believe in it. So the idea is that the Western civilization is losing its superiority and it has to be uh, defended by all means because the, the other civilizations are less valuable and then if they prevail, then they will throw the world in, in a certain sort of chaos. It's all based on this waterproof distinction between the so-called civilizations. We will uh, uh, continue, I think I have a little bit more time yet, uh, to see how much this is untrue and untenable from the historical point of view. But when um, uh, President Bush uh, formulates his idea of the right of the preemptive strike against conceived dangers and many, many other things about which I don't want to speak now. Um, 
they have either read Huntington or they are influenced by the ideas of Huntington or perhaps they have other thoughts and Huntington is a good justification for that. The only problem with Huntington is that historically it's untrue. Of course, I am not the, the, the first to try to go beyond the civilization model, and there have been very important steps. There is the idea of cosmopolises. Um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the cosmopolis is a dynamic concept, uh, contrary to the static concept of civilization. It's not a static entity. Cosmopolis means the organizational uh, principle of a large transnational area which is based on some cultural phenomena that are organizing uh, those areas and which are not necessarily or perhaps not at all uh, defined by religion. This connection of civilization and religion has been challenged by uh, subsequent historians. Uh, the, the, the concept comes from St Stephen Toulmin, Cosmopolis, the Hidden Agenda of Modernity. Uh, I'm now listing the, uh, some works and then uh, give a little bit of uh, explanation. Uh, the grand representative um, of the Cosmopolis idea uh, is the uh, Sanskrit uh, scholar Sheldon Pollock, The Language of the Gods in the World of Man, Sanskrit Culture and Power in P Modern India. And then Ronnie Tricci uh, picks up on it and she writes about Islam translated literature conversion and the Arabic cosmopolis of South and Southeastern Asia, where she defines the principle that maintains together this South and Southeast Asian Islam as a translation movement from the original Arabic. And recently Mahmoud Kuria, in fact a good friend of mine, um, uh, uh, introduced the concept of a cosmopolis of law. Stephen Toulmin proposed it to explain in an alternative and postmodern manner uh, the rise of modernity. For him, cosmopolis is a harmonious and orderly unity of nature and society, a world where the laws of nature and society are in harmony. Um, and it is this harmony which, according to Toulmin, were represented by early modern humanists like Erasmus and uh, Montaigne, and which is broken by the extreme rationalism of the 17th century represented by Descartes and Newton. Um, but when Sheldon Pollock uh, picks up this idea, he, he, uh, he, he transfers the concept uh, completely. For him, uh, Cosmopolis is a translocal and transcommunity cultural identification, um, which somehow represents the dialectic processes between the local and the global, and it's all time in evolution. Um, there is a constant element, the, the important cultural law of Sanskrit in the Sanskrit cosmopolis, but it's all in evolution and change, and um, uh, you see that it's uh, less of a combative concept than civilization. Um, Ronit Ricci argued that an Arabic cosmopolis in translation partly replaced and partly overlapped with the Sanskrit cosmopolis, so she's very much inspired by Pollock. And finally, uh, Mahmoud picks up the, uh, the idea and uh, uh, tries to understand uh, the unity of all these very different Islamic communities across South and Southeast Asia 
some of them patrilinear, others matrilinear, others even matriarchal, as unified by the loop. My question is still, okay, the static and combative character of the civilizations uh, is gone with the idea of the cosmopolis. It's a much more sympathetic notion, but it's still about the same entities. A very important issue is the wallerstein Gunderfrank debate about world systems. That was a big debate uh, in the last two decades of uh, uh, two, three decades of the 20th century, and in the first decade of um, of the 21st, it has a little bit settled, most of all because of the untimely early death of André Gunderfrank, who died in 2005. Immanuel Wallerstein, um, very much inspired by Marx, of course, um, wrote a big book, The Modern World System. And the first volume was published in 1974, while the second was published as late as 2011. Um, the first volume was about capitalist agriculture and the origins of European world economy in the 16th century. Wallerstein argued that it was the colonial expansion which first unified the world into one unity. Before that, there were fragmentary so-called world systems, but not a unified world system with capital letters. Um, and it is capitalist accumulation which then uh, produces uh, this colonial expansion and unifies the world. Uh, this is very much a continuation of Marx's truth. And Wallerstein is a sociologist. Um, and André Gunderfrank, who challenged this, uh, and, and Barry Gilles, who challenged this view. Uh, Gunder Frank is an economist. He has many, many books. Uh, he was one of the most pertinent uh, critics of neoliberalism. And, and Gunder Frank argued that whatever Wallerstein uh, presents as the, represent, uh, as the characteristics of uh, global capitalism, were already there, even before, for 5,000 years. The world has always been one unified economy. What is the relevance of this debate uh, to our subject, the civilizationist theories? While Wallerstein is not a civilizationist and is not uh, approaching world history from the point of view of culture, but from economic history, Yet, his fragmentary world systems are somehow mirror images of the civilizations from another perspective. If Gunder Frank and Gilles are right, then no, no room for civilizations, because even economically, the world was always united. OK, the Americas were outside, but the old world was united, and the Americans just joined this old world. Well, and even that is not true, because the Vikings went to America, and there were uh, communication between the Americas and the old world. They were not as intense as after that. OK, I have already summarized this. Now comes my very modest contribution. So these are the debates. You see with whom I am in sympathy and what do I not like. But here comes my own research very shortly in a nutshell. What I, uh, my own research mostly in India, but it's an extension of a research on the Mediterranean, the Near East, and so on. It is so that I arrived finally in India. And this research 
shows that the civilization theory is simply incapable of explaining the phenomena that we are encountering. First of all, is it true that there is no historical conscience in India? Um, let us see what happens in this search. Um, again, I'm still not there where I want it to be. Okay, because uh, I should mention Gandhi and modern Gandhian thinker, thinkers who have, like Ashis Manandi and Vinay Lal, who have accepted the challenge of the colonial uh, label, a historic India, and following Gandhi, present the ahistoricity of the Indian tradition as a superior character of Indian civilization. In that book, The History of History, which is a very uh, clever book, um, uh, Vinay Lal argues that history is a Western construct. It is not a science, it is an ideology. And this is the basis of his criticism of post-colonial, modern post-colonial Indian history, you are falling in the trap of the West. You want to apply history uh, instead of accepting that India is ahistorical. The myth tells more about India's soul than your history. Even if you try to read um, uh, the evidence uh, uh, between the lines and, uh, uh, and uh, against the, uh, how, is, how did Chakravarti say it? Um, so, uh, even then, you are in that Western trap. So, this is one approach. The other approach is that of David Schulman, Velcheru Narayana Rao, and Sanjay Subrahmanyan in their great book, Textures of Time, in which they are arguing that even if we don't find the proper historical literature in India, it's enough to look at the subgeneric markers in other uh, uh, genres, uh, literature, epics, um, uh, lyrics, um, and see uh, when the author wants to convey historical information. Um, but I have a more radical answer to this question based on my 25, 25 years by now uh, of working in Indian archives. Just go to the Indian archives and you will find this history. Uh, you will find it in Western archives, but less. The real history writing you find in the Indian archives. And I was just discussing with Dr. Bittista before uh, the talk, and she said that when she teaches uh, popular folk art and popular traditions, she always encounters oral history and history in images. Uh, the historical consciousness, there's no people without a historical consciousness. That was a big lie. There are different genres in expressing the historical consciousness. Those people are my interlocutors, the Syrian Christians of India, whose archives I have studied. But someone may argue, okay, this is a, a repercussion of Western civilization because they are Christian. But they have been Christians since, I don't know, uh, the, the first clear testimonies are from the sixth century not to speak about the legends of St. Thomas coming to India. Uh, they are an Indian people who have, uh, who have Indian customs, who speak an Indian language, Malayalam, and who had contact with West Asia. It doesn't make them European, most of all because their mother church was also Asian. And, <clears throat> and um, these are just some documents. This is a brief history of the community written to the magistrates of the Dutch Republic and transmitted by the visionary Jacob Kanter Wisher um, uh, 
in Malayalam. The history was written in Malayalam, but because they didn't think that anybody would understand Malayalam in Leiden and Amsterdam, they translated it to a European language they knew, namely Syriac. Because the language of communication between the European missionaries and the local Christians was in their literary language, which was playing the role of Sanskrit. Uh, what was the role of Sanskrit for the uh, Hindu communities? That was Syriac for the Christian communities. They were a very Indian community. They are. Um, and, and this is the beginning of the Syriac translation. Um, uh, not a precise translation, so I am quoting the Malayalam uh, with our, our own translation. It's about events in the ninth century. But I don't want, okay, you can read it and uh, it will be published sometime, it's not yet published. Um, the important thing is that this speaks about a persecution that the Christians in Chennai uh, suffered from the Pandyan kings. And the great persecutor for them was Manika Vachakkar, a Shriva saint of the ninth century. <clears throat> so that they were, <clears throat> who is called a magician, and they were unable to resist Manika Vachakkar, so most of them converted to Hinduism, and another part went to Kerala and intermarried with the Christians there. Now, the history is from the early 18th century, so it was transmitted to um, uh, Wischer in the 1720s. This is called pre-colonial um, in Indian history because the, the colonial history starts with the British, as I have learned. Okay, but, <clears throat> but, um, uh, but to have this story, and there are Portuguese sources and there are all kinds of sources confirming that this is correct historical memory, they had to have a continuous, partly oral, partly written transmission of their history from the ninth century. This is the point here. And, uh, but that this was, it was still in a European archive because it was sent to Leiden. But this I found to my greatest surprise and delight in an Indian library uh, uh, of Mannanam in near Kotayan. Um, it's a huge book of the history of the community from St. Thomas, as they think, um, but the data become very precise already from the 15th, 16th century onward. And, um, uh, and this is the, the first document that is inserted in it, because from the beginning of the 18th century, the whole chronicle is based on uh, copies of documents, either in Malayalam or in Syriac, which they found in an archive which was preserving these documents. Where is the lack of sense of history here? Um, no, I don't have time to read it, but you see, you see this is just very precise uh, data from the 16th to the early 18th century. This we have published by. And this is one of the most fantastic documents. With this I am closing. Um, uh, the, the earliest Malayalam uh, written document, the Tarisapali copper plates, um, uh, connected also to what uh, archaeologists found in Patanam. Uh, they are dated 849 AD. Uh, they are uh, written in Old Malayalam and partly Sanskrit in Watertu and Granda scripts. 
And finally, you have here signatures in Kufic Arabic, Pahlavi, Judeo Persian. Um, I think uh, this, is, this is the last plate because the whole thing is not the original but a copy. And members of a trade guild consisting of um, Muslims um, signing in Arabic, uh, Christians signing in Persian, um, Zoroastrians like the founder of this institute uh, signing in Persian and the Jews also signing in Persian but in Hebrew characters testifying to the authenticity of the copy. What was this? That was apparently a trade guild, perhaps those called Anjuvanna, um, a trade guild which was acting together and the whole trade guild um, consisting of, I don't know, they should all uh, belong to different civilizations, but they don't. They are Indians and their language is Arabic and Persian. Um, they are testifying to the authenticity of the copy of a very important document, which um, is a land donation to a Christian church in 849 by, uh, by the governor of Venet. To finish, here are my thesis. Civilizations as waterproof entities have never existed. Their existence is a colonial construct. Religions do, second, religions do not define culture or civilization. Religion is particular, usually exclusive. Culture is general, even universal. All spiritualities, and here I am following Pope Francis, not to say religion, have taught the unity of humanity and the universal fraternity between human beings. Four, whatever we believe to be a civilization is an inextricable web of economic, social, cultural interactions and not an uh, essentialized entity. Five, while there are indeed cultural differences between peoples, humanity has one unified civilization. Six, globalization is not a new phenomenon. We live in a world system since 5,000 years. And finally, any political action based on unscientific theories like clash of civilizations, great replacement theory, the defense of Western or Orthodox or Islamic or Hindu or Buddhist civilizations risks to bring disastrous consequences to the world. Thank you. So I hope there, are, there is room for questions. You saw Indian civilization is a I imagination, not thought. Can you explain? It's very difficult to explain. But this is what he has said. Um, he thought that he has a could be Because we are recording. Okay. So, so it's very difficult to explain because I think that's stupid. But that was said by one of the greatest philosophers of the West, Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel. So he thought that he had very little information about India. He got it from colonial sources, basically British. And he thought that this is a people living in dreams. And because they don't have history, we have seen that they do. Um, because they don't have history, they don't have a, 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 a philosophical thought like the Germans have, they are inferior. That's what he thought. But of course, I, I just uh, quoted it to show, to, to show the, uh, the, the very dubious origins of the civilizational theory. Is it acceptable what I'm saying? No, I said.
This is not what he is saying. He is just quoted people saying. I hope you don't accept Hegel, but perhaps you explain my explanation. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Uh, you mentioned that Gandhi himself thought that Indian civilization is superior to all others. So I just wanted to know whether, uh, after observing all of uh, all of this, I think whenever there is a nation-building process, somebody comes up with this concept of civilization, like these days we say that there is only one civilization state. This is, uh, I mean, the Chinese state because it can trace uh, back the culture to 3000 BC or something like that. So, uh, I mean, uh, do you think that this is the result of a, a rise of nationalism that we see in 18th, 19th century in Europe as well, uh, like French civilization or? Uh, maybe because there's a French nation and it's not just a property of the king. Or when, uh, let's say, in our case, we uh, trace back our history back to the Mauryans, our flag represents our... Uh, could, could you speak a little slower because I don't yeah. understand. So I was just saying that whenever there's, a, uh, uh, there's an establishment of a national myth, that, uh, let's say, Bharat Mata, which is, or Germania in Germany, they, uh, that is where we talk about civilization. That is the Germanic civilization, it's French or it's Indian, Chinese. Uh, before such national concepts, uh, when it was all about feudalism and these kinds, uh, th then there was no uh, such concept of civilization. Do you think it's like that? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think it, 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 how to say, it is connected to the rise of nationalism, but they were not thinking in terms of national civilizations. Nobody ever said that there is a German civilization, or a French civilization, or a British civilization. They thought that there was a European civilization based on some so-called common values, which they believed to be that of Christianity. Now, after the Holocaust, um, which was so cruel toward the, 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 the excluded Jews, nobody dares to say a Christian civilization as such. They speak about a Judeo-Christian civilization. And many Jews are happy with this. But it's still the same concept. So they were thinking in broader entities than, than national entities. And um, of course, when Gandhi was somehow not inventing, but representing a new nationalist movement in India, that was the nationalist movement of a huge country, one of the biggest populations in the world. So he believed that this, this, this new nation can be built on the basis of Indian civilization. The big hurdle there was uh, Islam, which finally led uh, to the partition. Um, now, how much uh, the, the Muslims of the subcontinent are part of the same civilization? That's a problem still for Indian civilizationist theories. And this is why I say that civilization is only thus far. Um, Gandhi wanted to believe in a common civilization which integrates Muslims as well. But they couldn't realize it, and most of all, there was also the, the British intrigue of splitting um, uh, the subcontinent. And we know how disastrous this was, how many deaths it has caused immediately, uh, and population exchange and whatever. Um, but. As I'm reading Gandhi, I, I see that he never uh, contested the concept of a civilization. There is a famous story when Gandhi uh, visited Sri Narayana Guru in Kerala, who was a, a Dalit, basically Irava, um, Advaitinist. Hmm? Ah, sorry, who was a Dalit, uh, Irava. Advaitinist, and the report is that he liked Gandhi, but he didn't understand the Indian nationalism, because his idea was that everybody is Atman. So how can you, uh, you, uh, you separate uh, uh, the Indian soul from the world soul? That was Sri Narayana Guru's uh, question. 
Um, and Sri Narayana Guru was a very interesting figure because while he was an Advaitin, he radically challenged the Brahminical uh, rule and uh, was basically a social reformer. Uh, um, so it's not a, no, it's a, it, 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 it's fashionable to criticize Gandhi. I don't want to criticize Gandhi. I just say that he was also a child of his times. Yeah, uh, thank you for that talk. Um, you very nicely summarized in the last slide how one is not supposed to define civilization. So my question is, how do you define civilization? I design it as a colonial concept. Right. Um, an invention. Uh, which has basically no uh, historical reality. So what would you like to replace it with? Um, to use a Sanskrit word, Vasudha. I'm sorry, could Vasudha. you Ah, Vasudheva Kutumbakam, is that yeah, what yeah, you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. that would be excellent. And um, In Greek, it's Oikumene. Sorry? In Greek, it's Oikumene. I see. The, the inhabited world. There is only one inhabited world. Right. The, the oneness of world. Right. Um, all these theories and all these theories which are rampant still are uh, trying to split the world into, uh, into uh, waterproof entities. And what is now uh, fearful right. because of the war in Ukraine there is this tendency to split the world into two camps once again. Right. And certainly the Russian aggression is responsible for that. But the Western reaction is also responsible for that. Right. Uh, sorry, just a follow-up question, if I'm allowed. Um, do you think that it is the basic human instinct of fear that causes, you know, people to say, this is me and that is you, and this is where I draw a line, and I won't allow you to know, encroach, as opposed to not being fearful, but allowing, accommodating, understanding, and empathizing with the other side. So do you think yes. there's yes. a dichotomy of human thought and behavior that, you know, underlies the two sides? I don't want to share versus I don't mind sharing because you know, that doesn't disturb my identity as a nation, as an individual. So do you think it is rooted in the emo emotion of fear yes. of the unknown? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the politicians, who, um, uh, our politicians are playing on that. Whether they, believe they are afraid or not, I don't know. But they want to generate this fear. And this is horrible. Thank you, Professor, uh, for the fantastic talk. I, I, th I also think it's a very timely talk, because right now in India, we are going through a whole nation and civilization project, like where we are trying to write an Indian civilization. So even your title, The Imaginary Civilization, it made me scared, because if India doesn't have history, then some of us are building that. The so-called history is being created. So. You know, this sudden, like, I'm a Syria Christian who's married to a Hindu. And again and again, I have to be, you know, I've, I'm trying to learn Sanskrit. I'm trying to learn Hinduism to be accepted by the rest of the country. So I feel like there's a project happening. And whether I like it or not, Indians, we are at a very economically powerful place right now. And we want to be very proud of a civilization that we don't understand. So there's a whole project happening right now. Gandhi's India is dead. I mean, nobody wants to be. I mean, it's sad to say this, but the language of RSS and this, you know, the right wing Hinduism is being spoken about. So suddenly this myth, Sanskrit, a, a kind of Hinduism, even I don't know. So it's, it scares me that if there is no history, if there is no civilization, somebody is building. So, it, so, you know, there's a whole argument that after Western civilization, it should be Indian and Chinese civilization that should take over the orders should need to be challenged. And the current government really pushes that. And now it's not even the governments, it's the people saying that. You know, intelligent people saying that 
it's time indian civilization take over whatever that means so it scares me your i mean when you were saying about hellenistic law i was thinking it makes sense for smaller groups like you know like smaller countries like greece india is a subcontinent and india is behaving like conquerors now like we are the conquerors we want to conquer sri lanka nepal in our behavior we are behaving like conquerors so this this cosmo the word you said cosmopolitanism is a great idea but indians are they are waiting to take over we want to be the conquerors deeply now because we have been you know waiting for our time for so long so i am also trying to figure out it's scary that civilizationist theory says that there is no civilization it means that the current you know people who are hungry for power they will create a story of indian civilization and a lot of people will start following them because i mean there is nothing else so i i am just trying to what i'm trying to say is i understand i agree with you completely but this this world order will be pushed and i don't know how to you know like how to stop not stop but how to counter it Uh, may I request the people who are asking the question to keep it brief so that but, but may, may, I, may I briefly answer? Yes. Um, I know, and this is why I I I wanted to start our lecture series with this subject. What can be done? I don't know. Um, um, my university has been expelled from Hungary because we are not belonging to their civilization somehow. Um, and it was founded by George Soros, who is at the forefront of all the evil powers who want to destroy the Western civilization. Of course, it's an imagination. It was a good rhetorical, uh, uh, rhetorical device uh, to rely, uh, to rally people uh, along them. Uh, but um, what I think, and it may be very utopistic, that we have to do good history. So I was uh, here uh, mostly speaking about theories and speaking about my own experience of discovering part of Indian history only at the end. But none of the phenomena that I'm encountering can be explained by this civilizational model. It's simply, it's not workable. And if it's not workable to explain history, then it's not workable uh, to explain political decisions either. And 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 of course, the the the, the Western colonial ideologists must have, should have, anticipated that the uh, that the peoples whom they oppress will. Uh, will invent their own civilizationist theories, like the Muslim Brotherhood began to uh, preach, I think, at the very beginning of the, uh, of, the, of the 20th century, it began to preach the superiority of Islamic civilization. But it's a Western concept. Why do the Indians need a Western concept, which is moreover uh, 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 already outdated? Because no real historian believes in this. I don't say no historian. I only say no real historian. We are encountering the facts. We have much more historical knowledge than our predecessors had in the 19th century. We have um, uh, unveiled so many uh, colonial and post-colonial deceptions. We cannot write history in this way anymore. A new Toynbee cannot be written. Uh, uh, my friend Sylvain Piron will give one lecture in this series on the, eco on the medieval roots of the ecological uh, crisis. He is way beyond Weber. Then why are the ingrained 19th century ideas the ripples of the nine, uh, uh, the fragment, the, 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 the illogical fragments of the outdated 19th century ideas determining our present day action. That's my question. I don't know what we can do, but perhaps we should go out, we uh, humanity scholars, and not enclose ourselves in our, our ivory tower, but speak up uh, 
accepting the, the, the risk of being wrong. Because as our predecessors were so many times wrong, we may also be wrong. Uh, can I ask you a question? You had showed a slide which had an extract from Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, and he says that the Cold, after the Cold War, liberal democratic uh, capitalism has replaced a Marxist state socialism, and then the next step is to sort of make uh, China, India, other countries adopt that. Uh, I, I do know that these are not your statements, but what I don't understand about that statement is that, number one, India, China, by the late 1990s, had already started moving away from Marxist state socialism to a more market-oriented capitalism, number one. Marxist state socialism in itself was a Western construct as well. And number three, uh, I mean, something which all Indians study as part of our history textbooks is that uh, India, China, Africa, we were rich regions of the world, rich countries, and until the second half, the second millennium CE, when the Persians and the Europeans came and plundered us. And well, I mean, capitalism may well have, uh, the word capitalism may have entered the European lexicon only by the 15th or the 16th centuries, but India, China, Silk Roads, I mean, that was very much capitalism in every sense of the world. I mean, that's mercantile capitalism fundamentally, so I really don't understand what he is really talking about. Um, he did not say that, that, that now, um, this is rather Fukuyama whom you, whom you quoted, that now uh, the Western capitalist system should be exported everywhere. That's not Huntington. Huntington is a much more pessimistic thinker. He thought that the first danger of, uh, of the Soviet uh, yeah, the Soviet, um, uh, the Soviet um, uh, socialist bloc is over. The next danger is the rise of the non-Western civilizations. He believes in the civilizations. For him, China, uh, the Orthodox belt, as he, uh, or the old Orthodox, Orthodox uh, uh, um, crescent, as he calls it, uh, Islam, are all terrible uh, threats that they, that they, they have become uh, very much uh, capitalized and, and they are powerful. This makes it a threat because whatever technic technological development they will achieve, it will be against us, the West. This is Huntington's completely crazy idea. What you said was very much Fukuyama's irenic idea, the end of history. Now everybody will be America. That was Fukuyama. Of course, it was another illusion. The, uh, the, but, but that was, I don't know, it was a less dangerous illusion. It was just stupid. But this is stupid and dangerous. That's the problem. And very quickly, uh, you started, I mean, the entire theme of the talk was the imaginary versus the real, and you started the talk with, and this is a counter to the previous question actually right there, you started the talk with a statement by the Hungarian Prime Minister, and I get it, like as a historian, you're critiquing his statements because the historical, theoretical underpinnings of his statement may not be very accurate. As a politician, he is not discerning and examining each and every word and the context, historicizing it. But the threats that he's talking about are very much real. Uh, and as, uh, as an up unapologetic right-wing conservative, had I been a Hungarian citizen, I would have most probably voted for him. And if Gandhi's India is dead, I'm very happy. Um, briefly, um, while our dear prime minister was enclosing the refugees who were trying to get refugee status in Hungary in concentration camps. For a year, I was visiting those camps with a Christian group, a Protestant Christian group, trying to bring some relief to these people. We saw incredible conditions. You don't imprison people who just want 
to be accepted, to live a normal life, who are fleeing war, who are fleeing uh, assassination. Who, who, uh, I spoke to an Afghan uh, woman. I asked, why did you come here? He said, the Taliban's have entered our village. Uh, they killed so many people, they picked up our eldest child, I don't know what happened to him, they made him a child warrior. And in order to, uh, to defend the other four children, uh, she came on the perilous way, leading her to Hungary. Are they the enemies of the state and of the enemies of Western civilization? How can you say this? I'm saying that because they are, I mean, after they migrate, they want to replicate the exact same conditions that they are fleeing from. How do you know? The exact, I mean, the, the mob violence, they all want the Sharia law to be implemented. That's all, that's all an untrue ideology. I spoke to these people. The only wanted, many of them were fleeing Islamic fundamentalism, like the Taliban's. They wanted only a normal life. They wanted to get integrated. They wanted to work. They wanted, uh, this is the ideology that these people, because they are coming from, a, uh, from an Islamic background, this is the state ideology. Uh, 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 I, I quoted Viktor Orban, but I know who, who was his counselor who was, who was uh, dictating this to him. I know him personally. So. Uh, so the idea is that because they come from a different cultural background, even in the third generation, they will not become integrated. And that counselor, you don't know the name, so I don't have to pronounce it here, he said that what we should do is to wrap all the Muslims who are coming to our borders into, uh, into uh, pork uh, leather and wrap them in. Um, these people are thinking like this. For them, the other is not a human being. And I cannot accept any such idea. And, and I saw those poor, poor refugees. Some of them, of course, were coming from uh, Islamic State background and so on. It was very easy to detect them and send them back. The, the majority were just very, very honest people. A friend of mine among them, who uh, um, his uh, father-in-law paid for his trip and told him, now flee because you and you, all your family will be killed if you stay here. He came from, uh, from Western Iraq. Um, and our leader was a Protestant preacher. Uh, this is how we got access. And when this Protestant preacher was speaking about the Bible, uh, my friend uh, 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 told, oh, he's, he's speaking very well. I read the same things in the Quran. Hi. Um, I love the talk. Uh, it was a very different way of looking at the world. Uh, and I'm really interested to know, um, to clarify a few things. One was, uh, you mentioned cosmopolisis. Yeah. Correct. So, uh, what I understood from the presentation was that um, you particularly, your thesis particularly, does not subscribe to cosmopolisis no. either because you, you believe it is more flexible but still a similar substitute to civilizational theory. Uh, how to say? Because it's still categorizing things. I, th I think this is a very good concept. I'm not against the concept. Mm. It's not a solution. Um, so these are wonderful books mm. by Sheldon Polo, by Ronit Ricci, by, by Mahmoud Kuria. I have nothing against them. Mm. Or, uh, but I, I think that we have to promote the idea of the oikumene. It's again not my idea. In, in this circle around Andre Gunter Frank, the idea was, was, was raised. Um, and uh, Oikumeni can be translated in, into many languages. In Sanskrit, it is Vasudha. Mm. And, 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 and this is what, what, what the Upanishad says. I, I, I cannot, you, you could quote it. I, I, I was not able. Yeah. That's it, yes. Um, 
it's it's uh, it's about the unity of of humanity, and and it's in the Upanishads, it's in the Christian teaching, it's in the Muslim teaching, Wahdat al Wujud. You find it everywhere. This is the basis of spirituality. Um, and perhaps I would even dare to say that from this religiously determined civilizationist theory, we should return to spirituality. And that will unite us and not divide. So um, a follow-up on that is, um, hmm, you partly answered the follow-up question as well, Sam. Changing it. So, sorry. No, so I'm, I'm thinking of a follow up question where uh, the, the, the thesis that you provided uh, of Vasudeva and, and Oiko, Oikos, right? What is the Greek word? Oikumene. Um, are there works or uh, ideas um, trying to model systems based on this? Because right now, as you rightly said, most of the systems around the world are based on a civilizational theory. Are there systems that are sources that I can read that talk about models of the world based on this other theory? Um, I may be not, uh, uh, not um, uh, well informed. Um, where I found the closest to this is uh, in uh, uh, these works by Andre Gunder Frank and uh, uh, and, and Jill's. Um, in that work which I quoted, just. Not this. Okay, I don't see without my eyeglasses. So, um, Andre Gunder Frank and. Do you see the, uh, the arrow? No. Uh, so, Andre Gunder Frank and Barry K. Gilles, The World System, 500 Years or 5,000. This is an edited volume with several uh, contributions. Wallerstein himself contributed and tried to refute Andre Gunder Frank. It's, it's a very good uh, um, volume with multiple approaches. And there are several articles. Uh, Treating this. This is the closest that I have found. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, there's a question here, and who has a question? Uh, you have a follow up question? Yes. Okay, I'll just come to him. Uh, this might be the last question because we are running out of time. Uh, that was a very wonderful lecture and I really like the idea of uh, multiple truths rather than one truth. You presented the idea and it was really good. So uh, my question is, um, so I completely agree with you that the civilizational, uh, you know, the framework is creating a lot of uh, commotion today. So what I'd like to ask is, um, along with this uh, construct, there also comes the, you know, uh, people try to desperately hold on to the values that that post the civilization, like for suppose like the Indic civilization or whatever the Western civilization or whatever the Christian civilization, whatever they have hold some uh, central values. So uh, by disregarding such a civilization construct, we might end up killing some of these values. So is there a way to go forward or what do you think about this? Um, I agree with Pope Francis that if we really believe in our values, then we will open our arms and not uh, and not uh, and not be cruel. If you are Christian, that group with which I was uh, visiting the so-called transit zones, which were in fact concentration camps, they were keeping in cages entire families for years. Finally, the uh, some of the inhabitants, one of them is a close friend of mine, became a close friend of mine, uh, an Iranian, um, um, uh, challenged this at a local court in Hungary, and the judge made the very clever move of referring all this to the European Court of Justice. And the 
Ab Abuzar Soltani is my friend's name. And, uh, and uh, he, his son, and another family have challenged the whole system. They, uh, they, they referred it to the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice has uh, uh, decided that it was illegal according to European laws, and they had to be transferred to open camps. 800 people were transferred to open camps. And then uh, they got, most of them got to Germany and Austria, but my friend Abuzar Soltani said, my friends are here in Hungary, I want to stay in Hungary. And he fought until he got the refugee status in Hungary. Uh, but for this you needed uh, the decision of the European Court of Justice. But that group with which I was visiting every second week for a year in those camps was a Christian group who believed who believe in the, in the Christian values and who believe that what, what Christ said, that, uh, that when uh, someone is there and is in need, you have to go and help. Of course we have to go back to our basic values, but our basic values are not cruel. Thank you, sir. And, and, and religion is good. Culture is good. The exclusivity of religion and culture is not good. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to mention because we were talking about this concept of Vasudev Kutamukam, and I think uh, somebody asked that whether there's a, I mean, if, is anybody actually following this concept or not? I think I've heard about this place in Pondicherry called Orville, and uh, I think they have this concept of Vasudev Kutamukam where anybody can uh, come and live like a. I mean, a human being, and that's it. There's no nationality or something like that. I haven't been there, but I have heard about this thing. Uh, 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 about Orville, or uh, in Pondicherry. Ah, uh, Sri Aurobindo. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, they have dedicated this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know uh, Sri Aurobindo's uh, teaching. I must, mm -hmm. I must admit, I have heard about it, but I don't know it from. So I can't, I can't comment, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, but the city itself, I, as, far, as far as I know, that city itself is totally based upon this concept. I, I suppose that, that, that he is very much influenced by the Vedanta. Hmm. But Vedanta has different versions. Shankara's Vedanta, uh, Shankara still affirms that you can become, uh, you can obtain moksha only if you are born a Brahmin. This is what uh, neither... Uh, uh, Sri Narayana Guru, no Ramana Maharshi has accepted. I don't know about Sri Aurobindo. Hindu. Excuse me. Last question. <laughs> Sorry. No, I just wanted to share. So yesterday, I had gone for a Japanese family law conference. Some professors had come, and they were sharing that how Japan's uh, population is going down. The fertility is zero and the next generation don't want to have kids. So I asked this question that Japanese were very proud of their civilization and they're xenophobic. They don't let others come in, but they don't have people anymore. There is no younger generations. So the professors were sharing that they are trying to convince the government that you need to start having policies which are friendly for migrants, outsiders, because there are no Japanese anymore. So even though there is a new way of thinking of a different civilization, so I, I thought it was very interesting that Japanese are coming to India. You know, we were trying to have these conversations on family law, like what can be done? Because you can't be closed forever. Your country do, doesn't have population anymore. It's the same with Europe. I mean, one day there is no population. So whether you like it or not, there will be intermixing and you have to think about a greater civilization. I agree with you. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, in Hungary, they try to solve it by uh, family-friendly laws, which is a very good thing. Um, but it doesn't work. So, because they have lack of uh, labor, they are excluding the migrants, and they are importing guest laborers from the Philippines, from India. Now, recently, when 
the deliver, when the delivery boy brought some pizza to us, um, I wanted to speak to him Hungarian, but he did not understand. He was either an Indian or a Pakistani. Um, uh, so it's a very hypocritical, um, because for political reasons, we don't let enter those who are knocking on our door, but we go out and hire cheap uh, labor from the Philippines because we don't have labor. And even if the family-friendly laws would work, but apparently they don't, or not enough, uh, that will have its effect in 20 years or more. Thank you, Stefan, for this amazing lecture. We wish you all the best in your journey of finding many truths. This is a small token of appreciation from us. Thank you so much. And thank you for, to the audience for this intense uh, questions. It was a very good discussion. Please join for tea outside in reception. And thank you for your lively and interesting and challenging presence.